In this episode of the Houndsman XP Podcast, we are rejoined by our good friend, Josh McKellis. And Josh uh, just about browned out the internet here lately with a list of things that you need to pay attention to if you're a competition coon hunter. Josh and I are going to go down that list and discuss each topic in detail. Every person who hunts needs to listen to this podcast, whether you're hunting jaguar in South America, leopards in Africa, lions, bears in in the United States, it doesn't matter. If you're chasing samba deer in Australia, you need to listen to this podcast. And why is that? Why do you need to listen to this? Well, I will make this statement right now. There is no other form of competition in the hunting hound world that has influenced and shaped our culture and the style of hounds that we have as houndsmen as much as competition coon hunting has. Competition hunting has shaped the style of hounds, influenced so many characteristics of the hounds that we use to pursue our game of choice. I want you to think about it like this. There was a horse that influenced the American Quarter Horse at a very high level. And this horse was originally bred to be a racehorse. And then he became a great halter horse. And then he completely influenced and had a huge impact on the cutting horse industry. That horse's name was Doc Barr. So while we may not specifically be interested in competition hunting as houndsmen, or you may never have any desire to do that, or you think that it has no influence on your life, you need to know where these hounds that we're hunting have come from and where their roots are. Dale and Clell Lee got their hounds from coon hunters that made their mark through competition hunting. Albert Vaughn is one of those men. Burton Oney. The English breeder is one of those coon hunters that has influenced our big game hunters. Uh, Lester Nance and his Nance bred walkers started out as coon hounds and got their start in competition hunting. Who hasn't heard of the hammer bred dogs and Dave Dean? The list goes on and on and on. So this is my sell to you. Listen to this podcast so that you understand what is going on in the competition coon hunting world to be able to relate it to the style of hound that you're looking for today and how it is being influenced. If you're already a competition hunter, man, this thing is right up your alley. You're going to enjoy it. And you might need to eat a little slice of humble pie, as we all do from time to time, and face some facts and face the truth. And Josh McKellis, lays this thing out in a way that is masterful. In this great conversation, we are going to take away all of the excuses for those nights when things don't go your way. Without any further delay, we're at a competition hunt. The Old South is sitting there. The gates are banging on it because those dogs need to get out. It's time to dump the box. Josh McKellis, you practically browned out Facebook last week with this uh, post you put up on Big Show Hunting Productions. And man, I'll tell you what, it just, uh, I don't know that I've ever read a more comprehensive, well thought out and articulate list and just darn good advice. So welcome back to the podcast. Let's, let's talk about this 10 tips for competition coon hunters that you wrote out. But before we get, hey, before we get there, let's, Let's take care of our audience because we've got people from, believe it or not, we're like the number one outdoor podcast in Saudi Arabia. That's awesome. Who, yeah. <laughs> Whoever is listening to me in Saudi Arabia, thank you. We are number one in Saudi. So, we were we were number one in Saudi Arabia last week. I think we're there leg- were nine. We're legends in Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm burying all the competition. <laughs> but <laughs> but no, Josh. You know, it's no secret. I mean, you are a competition coon hunter. 
uh, you're a coon hunter, but you love to competition hunt. You're doing do. well with a female you got right now. And, um, a lot of experience and things like that, but for the diversity of our audience break down in 10 minutes or less, what competition coon hunting is. Um, it, we're going to use terms throughout all this, like cast and judge and guide and things like that. So this is important to know that what happens is, uh, one of these kennel clubs, uh, I don't even have to be a kennel club. There's non-sanctioned events too. Uh, but most of them are the United Kennel Club UKC or the Professional Kennel Club, Club PKC. And uh, they will host a hunt. Uh, you drive to said hunt with your dog. And uh, you go there and what they do is they draw out casts. And uh, casts can be anywhere from three to four dogs. Uh, in very, very certain circumstances, you may have a two dog cast uh, in PKC anyway. But uh, you go out, you... Uh, have a judge with you, you have a guide with you, and your dog is basically put up against the other dogs in that cast, and they score those dogs accordingly to how they perform. Now, we're going to use terms like strike and tree and things like that too, which most hound hunters are going to know what that is, but not everybody. Uh, so what you do is the judge could be a hunting judge or a non-hunting judge, depending on the kennel club and the rules and the type of hunt at that club. Uh, but you turn the dogs loose. Uh, the first one to bark uh, gets first strike, second one, second strike, and so on and so forth. First dog to tree uh, gets first tree, second dog gets second, third, and fourth, and the points are awarded accordingly. Uh, anytime a dog is alone, it automatically gets first tree, so you can have multiple first trees on, on one drop. So it's, it sounds complicated, it, it really, in, in some aspects, it really is complicated. I mean, it, it's definitely a different level, but uh, really it, it does usually sort out uh, who the most talented coon dog is. Some dogs get lucky and win and don't look as good as a dog that loses, but that's not as common as people think. Usually the best dog wins and the dog that trees the most coons usually wins. You got that right. That was less than 10 minutes, Josh. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I can be pretty quick when I want to. Yeah. Yeah, so you're exactly right. I mean, there there have been times when I've entered competition coon hunts and the best dog didn't win, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, most of the time, the best dog. Everybody, even if even if you don't, even if if you leave there with a scorecard in your hand, what I found, and you didn't have the best dog in the cast, you know it. Yep. Everybody knows who the best dog is in that cast. And I've seen casts where, uh, you know, dogs have just put on an absolute coon tree and clinic mm -hmm. and they walk away with a win. And I've seen other times where uh, the best dog in the cast, they just made a, a bobble here or there and another handler took advantage of that or whatever, and they didn't win. So, yep. uh, but, but I would, say, I would say nine out of 10, about nine out of 10 casts, the dog that, performs the best usually win you're a lot more optimistic than i am <laughs> <laughs> you must be winning a lot right now yeah. you're winning a lot right now that's why you say that yeah i no. feel good about it now <laughs> uh, i go on a four or five cast losing streak i'll be like oh man there's it's terrible <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's right well i'll tell you what let's let's jump into this this thing because i i think that uh competition coon hunting is one of those deals that um people that are good at it seems like they're always the the people that that come to the hunts and you can you can bet that they're going to be competitive mm -hmm. and then there are the people that come to the hunts that if they get beat that they got cheated or there was some some grand conspiracy and and something against them and, and what I saw you do with this list was just spell it out. So, so let's jump into it and I'll read the first one. Cause it's, uh, if I can find it, it's, it's already disappeared from my phone. <laughs> read it, Josh, and I'll find, find them. You read, you read what you wrote and let's discuss it. Okay. Uh, number one was, uh, know the basic rules. Uh, you don't have to know them all. That's impossible. Most can only be learned through doing. So get the gist and get out there. And then my phone just automatically turned off too about halfway through reading that. 
Uh oh. And uh, at the end of it, I say, you know, the boys that do know the rules, they will teach you proper when you pay that entry. Yes. Yeah. So know the basic rules. You don't have to know them all. That's impossible. And that's why, like, UKC has spent time, you know, publishing mm -hmm. things like the Coonhound Advisor. Yep. You know, where you actually get in there and you define rules. And then Jerry Mall with uh, PKC writes the Mall Corner yep. and talks about rules and things like that. So, but, but that's that nine times out of 10, I've found that, that if I feel like that something didn't go my way, I've been beat plenty. Um, I can look back and find out where I made a mistake or find mm -hmm. a place where I could have known the rules better and not been taken advantage of. So, so tell me the benefits to, uh, of, of knowing the rules. Why, why do there need to be rules in a competition? hunt? Well, just like any competition, you have to have a baseline. You have to keep people from cheating. You have to have to do things as far as score wise and time wise that make the most sense for the competition. And, uh, you know, you can't just turn every dog loose and, uh, see who trees the most coons in the end of two hours because there's going to be arguments about that. You know, if me and you go turn loose and these dogs are getting deep and they get treed and we're just pleasure hunting and they're out of hearing when they do it, we don't know who treed that coon. Mm -hmm. You know, so how do, how do you score that? In a competition hunt, uh, there's rules set place to where, you know, the handler, which we'll talk about that later, who's part of this team, this dog handler team, can make up for some of those inconsistencies, you know, using the rules and doing the things like they're, that they're supposed to do, you know, to help the dog along. And so maybe me and you were in a cast and these dogs are over a hill and we can't hear them. And I stopped just a little split second before you do, knowing my dog's probably treed and I get him treed in, you know, before you do. And we, I may not have treed that coon, mm -hmm. but the hand, the handler did his part on that. And, uh, you know, I get first tree, you, you get second. And that's just part of being a good teammate. Yeah, and, and rules are just part of competition. You can be the best street brawler in the world right. and show up at a boxing match and be disqualified, or you can show up yeah. at the UFC and be disqualified, yeah. or you can be a you know have the fastest horse around and put them on the track and get disqualified or, or get beat. So yeah. you know it's just part of it. If you're going to show up, you got to you got to take time to to know those rules. And when I say you don't have to know them all. That's impossible. Even I, I've seen some of the top handlers on the planet had come in a situation and some of the best judges come in a situation where we're not sure what to do. Yeah. And, and you've got, you know, you've got a point on that later yeah. on about yeah. how to handle stuff like that. Exactly. And you know, you get on Facebook and uh, the UKC forums <laughs> or ProHound or any social media, and you'll always get this question, you know, what do I need to do to go to a competition? And I'll just know the rules front to back and know your dog. Well, that's very good advice. That's sound advice. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to know how to apply those rules and know how to use those rules unless you get out there and do it, you know. So you're not, you know, you can read that and read it and you can read the blue book and you can use the, you read the UKC uh, coonhound rule book and you can you can know every word on it that doesn't mean that you know how to apply that in the woods and that doesn't mean that even they don't account for every situation and so yeah you want to know you want to know all the rules you can know but don't let not knowing everything keep you from going and trying it good advice when I, when I say that the guys that do know the rules will teach you proper when I was up and coming and I'm 15, 16 years old, and I'm drawing Kurt Ehrings and James Leeches and guys like that that have been around, they're, they're going to let you know the rules, and they're going to beat you on them, and you're just going to have to take your lumps and your bruises and keep going until you're at the level as those guys are too. So. That's right. And, and those guys, I've, I've noticed over the years, you know, I live in Indiana, so mm -hmm. we've got some – we're a hotbed for competition coon hunting here and the best handlers, whether it's Ronnie bone or, you know, whoever it is, uh, I'll tell you a guy that I've always had really good cast with is Kevin cable. Yeah. You know, hunting with cable at the, at the, at the end of the cast, 
he's going to help you find coons. But, but at the end of the cast, mm -hmm. you can talk about it. You know, once, yeah. once the time's up and the, the hunt's over, you know, you talk about it. Where did, yeah. where did we mess up? And I, I beat you right here. This is, this is where I beat you. Yeah. Or I can tell him and say, this is where I beat you. Cause I'd be, you know, I beat cable and he's beat me. I, I wish, I wish, uh, uh, you know, I've been as successful as Kevin, but he's yeah. got a different goal than I got with him. That's so. one thing. All the, all those top handlers, like, like the cables and, and the Yants and the guys like that, they, they lose all the time. Oh yeah. Yeah. They lose a lot. Now they win more than we do and they win more than 99% of the guys out there, but they also lose and they also know how to lose and they also take it like gentlemen and stuff. And that's part of the sport. Too. And if you look at, yeah, you look at the guys, like you take Burke Holder for some, you know, he, the guys won a lot of, a lot of different stuff. Yeah. Um, but Steve is of the mindset that a good dog will pay for itself. Yep. You're going to get beat, but a good dog will pay for itself. You take somebody like Jeff Rickliffs, you know, that, that just, uh, it, from the outside looking in, it's like, man, the guy never gets beat, but he gets beat. Yeah. Yeah. I just beat him two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. And Jeff was, I always enjoyed drawing Jeff and yeah, and Jeff absolutely. Good, and Jeff was packing a really good dog. That Kobo, I think is what he calls him. He's a young dog, just a two year old. And, uh, that dog treed two coons and then just got out of pocket. And, you know, if he ain't out of pocket, you know, maybe he gets his third coon before rain gets her third coon treat and beats me. You know, it's right. Uh, that's a good dog and a good animal. Right. Right. So you got to know the rules. All right. Yep. Read the next one. See, let's read this next one. Okay. Uh, know your dog, not just the barks he makes, but what he is actually doing. Be your dog's biggest critic. Don't make excuses for it or it will never get better. And it will never. And I want to say this emphatically. It will never win consistently. That's a pretty bold statement. So lay that out there. What your mindset was just run th well, through that whole thing there. You, you get these guys that get soured after one or two casts and they haven't won and their dog, they're, they're so proud of their dog. They're blinded by it. Uh, they don't want to admit that their dog's doing this. They don't want to admit that their dog covered late. They don't want to admit that their dog's, you know, beating around on a bad track when he should be moving around better. He don't want to admit he's running trash or treat a slick or whatever. But until you remember to admit those things and know those things, you can't make that dog better. And that dog to win at a high level or win any cast consistently, I don't care if it's a $15 UKC hunt down the road or a $6,500 pro classic you're, you're not going to win unless you know what your dog's doing and you know how to make him better because just like kids, you know, if my kid goes out there and he's Oh, for 17, you know, from the free throw line and I'm not making excuses because the rim's too small, I mean, <laughs> the, kid, the kid just can't shoot free throws. And yeah. so, you know, and sometimes this dog that we're so proud of and, and I've always, one of the things I've always had is they're all good behind the house. Uh, when you turn a dog loose with by itself, there's no pressure. It can do what it wants, and it may go tree two or 300 coons for you that season. But when you line three dogs up next to it eight hours from the house, strange it's dogs, it's a different ball game. It's a different world. They're, the, the dog's under pressure for two straight hours, and they're not going to respond the same. So you just you see these guys that they do have really good coon dogs and probably talented coon treers, but they can't admit that what their dog's doing wrong and therefore they can't work on it and they just don't get any better. Do you think that a competition coon dog is a better coon dog than, you know, the one that's, that looks good behind the house? I, that's a just, that's a good, very good question, Chris. Um, Put you on the spot. Yeah. I think <laughs> that because what I'm looking for is that competition coon dog. So I got to be honest with myself too, that like you take my old dog does, there's not a more talented coon treer in this planet. He's got all the bells and whistles. Uh, he's a good track dog. He's super accurate. He's loud, you know, but sometimes not all the time he's won a little, but he's just a wreck in a cast. Sometimes he just loses his mind. He does strange things. You don't know what you're going to get out of him. So do I think he's better than a dog like, rain who maybe doesn't have the talent but is more geared towards competition side it's it's hard to say uh, a lot of it has to do with how a dog's raised and how they're bred and 
how they're brought up by that handler. So, you know, it, it's hard to say six and one half and does the other. I feel like I'm really stepping around this question a lot. Well, I'll, I'll weigh but, in. I'll wait. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead and finish but, it. And then yeah, I'll weigh I, in. I do think a good competition coon dog is better than a behind the house coon dog. I really do. Okay. So I'll give you an example. I had a, I had a dog named Boone and he was a mm-hmm. plot. He was a nice hound, you know, um, I could, I could take him. He, he just never seemed to embarrass me, but if I handle when I'm just out hunting, you know, when I'm just out hunting, but I could take him and have two casts in a row. He looked like a million bucks. And then the third cast, boom, he's falling apart and he's doing stupid stuff. He's hanging around, you know, why is this dog hanging around? And, and why is he, why is he, you know, uh, not getting off by himself. Why is he not doing this? And so, you know, dogs are still pack animals. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's instinctively deep down inside their pack animals. So we're almost, when we're talking about competition coon dogs, we're almost looking for that freak of nature, that loner that, that yeah. doesn't care about any other dog in the world. And, and that's an anomaly in, in the hound world or the dog world is that they don't want to really be social. Yeah. Good competition dogs are, are weird. Yeah. yeah that's the only way I can strike. They're weird. They're a weird dog. You know, most of them you, you take, uh, there's, there's a few, you know, that, but even th- those, those pure, true, never want to be around a dog, dead loners that you never see cover in eight or nine years. They're usually weird dogs. You know, they're just different. They're not like what you're used to. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right on that. It's just, they're, they're definitely a different breed. Yep. They don't care if you pet them or not. They don't yep. care. All you need, Hey buddy, all you need to do is get me to the woods and turn me loose yep. and, and, and that's, and feed me, you know, the I'm rest of the time, the rest of the time will be was, funny. One of my favorites was stylish Bella, who I won the pup hunt with a couple of times and that dog won me. I don't know, $44,000, $45,000 or something like that, you know, in non-sanctioned hunts and PKC. And she hated my guts until the day she died. She never wanted to touch <laughs> her. You couldn't catch that goofy heifer in a 10-acre pen. If you well, why, would you, why do you hunt? Night. But is that good? I mean, why are we hunting that stuff? I think it's because... Well, for one, she won and she was a really good coon dog and she had her coons and she, now you could catch her tree and she didn't care. And she liked being pet up at a tree, but you could reach your hand in the kennel and she's going to step back. You know, she's going to, you know, you can't just turn her loose in the yard. And if she's not treated, you're not going to get your hands down her unless you run her down. And she was like that with me. She was like Jed owned half of her. She was like that with Jed. And she was just had that mentality, but also with that mentality comes with, she didn't care who turned her loose. She didn't care where she was. She just wanted to go tree coons. Mm-hmm. And she knew when I had my hands on her, she couldn't go tree coons. And so yeah. she was, she worked well for that situation. I didn't like it. I didn't like pleasure hunting her. And, you know, she wasn't a, a mile through the country or anything like that. She usually just tree coons as she come to him. So it wasn't terrible. But I know one time out at the uh, Labor Day Classic, I chased her through a trailer park. Her, uh, she was three miles from where I cut her because by the time I chased her off three times or something like that, and she was out in the middle of nowhere in this trailer park and pit bulls hitting the end of the chain trying to bite me. And I mean, it was a mess. I swore I'd never turn her loose again. And then, of course, I do. So, yeah. So you just attacked my hometown heritage. Yeah. Uh, I did. It come to Indiana hunting a trailer park. Out in the middle <laughs> of nowhere, this trailer park was too. <laughs> You I had remember who I can't uh, remember who was guide. Rex Robinson was on the cast. Uh, I withdrew after the first. They treated a couple of coons and she. How far did wrong. you drive? How far did you drive from? Where was where was Labor Day Classic at the Greensburg. time? Greensburg. It was at Greensburg. Yeah. Yep. And how far do you think you drove? This would have been four years ago. I'd say not far. Maybe 35, 40 miles. <laughs> you were in Jennings County around Indiana Gardens. I probably was, but it was flat where we turned loose. And then yep. I went down this great big, it seemed like a mountain. And then it kind of flattened out again. And she was in that trailer park out in the middle of some national forest or someplace out there. Man, some old boy stepped out with a 
Budweiser and a beard down to his belly button asked what I was doing. And I said, I'm just catching this coon dog. And he goes, all right. And he just walked back inside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Apparently he'd seen it. Before. I guarantee you ran yeah. Indiana gardens. Yeah. 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 All yeah, right. So. so let's, let's move on to the next one. Uh, okay. Drive your own truck if possible. I'll set this one up a little bit. You so bet. when you go, when you go to a competition coon hunt, you know, everybody shows up there mostly in their own vehicles. Every mm -hmm. once in a while you have people that, that buddy up, but tell us why it's important to drive your own truck. For one, it makes it easy on the rest of the cast. Uh, this is a very personal deal for me too, but um, I had a cast down at the Lone Star one year and I'm hunting dollar and dollar was a big dog. Dollar weighed 85 pounds. And, uh, we show up, it's a four dog cast. Uh, there's one spectator. So, and the guide, so we got six people on this cast and we have, uh, one person drove. And that was one of the one, just one guy I'd rode down. It's 12 hours down there. I'd rode down with Jed. I didn't have a truck and three other guys in the cast were in the same boat. So we finally get one little S 10 borrowed and it don't even have a dog box. We got guys tied in dogs in the back and riding in the back and yeah i've got dollar shoved in this little pet crate with this 40 pound female and i mean it was a mess and so uh you know i like to drive my own truck because i forget stuff all the time and i know if it's in my truck i won't it'll be there yeah and for two it just makes it easier on the guides it makes it easier on the judges it makes it easier on the rest of the cast members because you can get in a situation where you don't have a ride and plus at the end of that cast especially in PKC, them dogs are scattered out all over the planet. And so sometimes it takes guys helping others get dogs and we're driving around over here to pick you up and things like that. So it's just a good idea to drive your own truck. I should have put that as number one. Plus I'm a neat freak. So I don't like getting in a lot of these coon hunters trucks. <laughs> right. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing that it always did for me was, uh, you know, so t taking into consideration that if you get a dog that's out of pocket, and you got to call mm -hmm. timeout. You've got a time limit on how long it takes you to recover you your hound. And if you're riding with somebody else, or you go to a hunt with expecting to oh, hit your ride with somebody. I never liked putting somebody in that position yeah. to, to run me around. Jerry Mall always had a really good line. You know, you draw it with Jerry at a, at a, uh, open event or a UKC hunt. Mm -hmm. And he would just tell guys, he'd be like, anybody is welcome to ride with me but I'm driving. Yeah. And that's a great way to approach that. You know, anybody is welcome to ride with me, but I'm driving. Now I'll take that a step farther. I use that, but I also went to the extreme of if, if you're going to hitch a ride, I don't care if all four of you want to ride with me, but there's only one dog riding in my side of my dog box, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just that way. There's no yeah, I sense. Don't like, I don't like other, I don't like putting two dogs in a box very rarely. And I definitely don't like what I'm hunting in a cast to be in a box or something else either. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're taking two dogs that don't know each other and putting mm -hmm. them in the same side of the box. I've seen that affect dogs the rest of the night. Yep. You yep. know, I mean, you, they can, they can get mad at each other or they can be best friends and neither one of them is good in a cast. That's right. That's right. So that was always my deal was, yep, you can ride with me. If all three of you want to ride with me, that's fine. But they're all going on that side of the dog box. This, yeah. I drove to my dog box. I'm, I'm hauling mine over here. Yep. So, all right. This next one is huge because this is probably the most thankless job, uh, for at a, at a competition hunt yep. and you've got, thank your guides. I should have put tip your guides too, because they get i think the guide fee at some of these bigger hunts like 20 bucks or something and a lot of these guys aren't coon hunters they're just friends of friends that are helping the club and they're they're doing this out of the goodness of their heart and yeah i've been guided to some crummy spots at these big events but man it ain't their fault you know and so they don't get anything for it they're up all night uh luckily now with the garments and the doctors and things like that, they usually don't have to walk step for step with you like they used to, which it's still nice if they do sometimes because, you know, they show you things that aren't on a map. 
but uh you know they're there toward the end they're helping you get dogs they're up till three or four in the morning on these big week-long hunts a lot of times they got to work the next day and they're doing all this so we can enjoy the sport that we have and they get hardly nothing for it mm -hmm. so i mean I, I there's nothing i hate worse than someone griping out a guide or getting mad at a guide even if he's doing a crappy job at least he stepped up and tried to help you know when nobody else would so yeah yeah if you come if you come to one of the locations of a lot of these big hunts these multi-day mm -hmm. hunts those things are hosted in areas that are known to have raccoons yeah you know, there's a reason why Autumn Oak stays at in, in at Richmond, Indiana. Yeah. Uh, is because of the network and the, the raccoon population. So can you get dry hold there? Yeah. But the the one that, that gripes me, Josh, is you know, the guy that that shows up to guide and he takes three casts mm -hmm. and he drops a cast here, he drives eight miles down the road, he drops a cast here, he drives another 10 miles and drops a cast here. And, and then the, what gripes me about it is people will complain about that. Yep. And to my thinking is you 100% would not have had an opportunity to hunt if he had not agreed to do that. You bet. And he's not intentionally trying to dry hole you. He's doing the best he can with what he's got. Yep. And we've all been in bad situations with some questionable guides. I mean, I have a lot of guys sure. have, but you know, all it takes to fix any bad guide is, you know, get better guides, but that's easier said than done whenever they're not getting anything for it. You yeah. know, I don't yeah. want to, I don't, I want to coon hunt, but even if I wasn't saying I'm a deer hunter or a coyote hunter or just some farmer down the road, I don't want to stay, stay up till four in the morning chasing somebody's coon dogs. And yeah. these guys that do, or, or we, we don't appreciate them nearly enough. I know yeah. Kevin Ellis helps us a lot down in, in the hunts in Texas and he gets guides and a lot of these guys don't even coon hunt and then they're just there to help because they're, they're, they're really good people. And we just, uh, you know, taking your misery out on your judge is just never a good idea under any circumstance. Agreed. Agreed. Your guide. I'm sorry, guide. There you go. All right, number five is a big one, and it, it might yeah. take up some time. Read it. Read it and tell us what you're saying there. Never pay an entry you can't afford thinking you'll win it back. If you count on a dog to keep food in your belly, you're going to be hungry. Dogs aren't nearly as reliable as a paycheck. And you're starting to see this more and more with some of these higher entry fee hunts. Uh, guys don't look at what it costs. They look at what they can win, and, and they – they probably do have a good dog. I don't know, but for some reason I've never seen these guys win that really, really need it. You know, they, there's a lot of pressure on the handler when you're trying to pay your electric bill with your winnings and your dog's down a coon at the end of a hunt Yeah, and you make mistakes, you argue, you make bad calls. You, you generally, and we, a lot of us have been in cast where people really have to win and, you get in that situation who's to say what you're going to do to win maybe you move a dog at the end of a cast maybe you you know do something you're not supposed to or something that's unethical just to get a win so these dogs and don't don't get me wrong i love them and i've been on a streak here lately but i'm not counting on that paycheck from that hunt you know i'm going to go to work every day and make sure my kids are fed and my lights stay on because if you go to counting on one of these dogs you're you're going to be you're going to be in deep doo-doo because they're they're not as reliable as we think they are right right yeah it's spending the grocery money on entry fees is not yes. a good practice and, no, and it, it just makes it it puts that handler under so much pressure and it makes them very hard to deal with in a cast because what i tell people is that these higher entry fee hunts which is you know where you're going to run into a problem like this uh are my favorite because all these guys know the rules uh they know their dog there's no arguing there's no bickering it's uh, non-hunting judges for the most part and they are the most laid back calm easy cast in the world until you get someone that really has to win in there and then it really takes a lot of joy out of for everybody else too i i entered my first competition hunt in 1985 
And there were guys back then that were spending the kids lunch money yep. on night hunt entries. And you're talking yep. about 10 or $15. Yep. And I, it doesn't matter whether you're going to competition coon hunts or you're a bear hunter, or you're a lion hunter. Uh, if you take care of things at home first, mm-hmm. then you enjoy your time and your experience and you don't put that pressure on yourself yep. and, and you can actually enjoy what you're doing because if you go out there and you've got all these other pressures on you, it transfers right down the leash to that hound that you're trying to hunt, that you're trying to yep. train, that you're trying to enjoy. So it's like, you're just, you're, you're beating a dead horse or, you know, you cannot enjoy both. And so my advice always is take care of the home front first, and then you can hunt with a clear conscience. You know, one of the reasons why I don't deer hunt Josh on my own place is because I can be sitting in that tree stand and be sitting there and thinking, man, there's a bunch of stuff I could be doing down at the house right now. (laughs) I never feel that way with, I never do that. I never feel no. that way with hounds though. No, I yeah. do the same thing. I, if I deer hunt, I got to make sure I go at least 50 miles from the house Yeah, or turkey hunt. Cause I'm right. eight o'clock. I'm telling my kid, you know, eh, I don't think the turkeys are going to be out today. You know, maybe we should go back and get that garage cleaned out. Or <laughs> <do something. laughs> I'm sitting up there and I'm looking at the tree, yeah. a tree down thinking, man, I had to go get the saw and cut that up for yeah. firewood. Yeah. You know, bang, there goes your deer hunt. Good advice, man. Don't, don't, don't pay entry fees you can't afford i mean no and i mean we got to remember this is a hobby and we also got to remember that those dogs have an innate sense of what kind of mood their handler is in any transfers right down the lead does it does you said it transfers right down the lead and that's correct you know when i'm and plus these guys that really need to win it seems like they overwork their dog going into that cast you know and they they usually are still training on them on Thursday when the hunt's on Friday. And that's never a good idea in my opinion, you know, so it's just, you know, don't do it. If there's, if there's a ton of pressure on you to win, I don't suggest you do it at all. Yeah. So much of, uh, communication with your hound is nonverbal. I mean, it's amazing in the dog world. It's huge, huge. Yeah. Yeah, 80% of people, and I think some of the recent studies have shown like 95% of your body language is how your dog is communicating with you. Yep. So yeah, they'll understand verbal commands and stuff like that, but they pick up on those cues. So if you're yep. frustrated, don't think you're hiding it. You're not hiding it from your, your, you know, your, your wife and you're not hiding it from your dog. That's Guarantee fact. it. That's Guarantee fact. it. All right. Number six. Uh, don't go into a cast with a chip on your shoulder. The other handlers aren't out to cheat you and thinking they are before they do causes problems every time. <laughs> and that is the truth, man. You see these kids that, and I know I get on a social media rant on here a little too much sometimes, but you see these people that, oh, I went to this cast and it ain't nothing but mean dogs. And these guys are cheating you out of your eye teeth and stuff. And I can't express enough how it's not like that and how the problems that come into a cast are usually from people with that mindset before they ever leave the clubhouse. Yeah. You know, they're, they're on such guard that they think that they're getting cheated all the time. And they're usually newer guys that aren't real familiar with the sport or the handlers or things like that. And man, it just makes for a miserable cast. And when you get a name for someone that's hard to be in a cast with, it takes a long time for that to go away. If ever. Sometimes it never goes away. Sometimes it does, but that pain, that, that idea that people have of you, it, it carries on, not just through the two hours that you're hunting that night, but throughout the rest of your career sometimes. Yeah. And it's always these guys that think they're getting cheated, but usually don't know what their dog's doing and usually don't know the rules and they're not getting cheated. But and the next day they're blowing up social media talking about how they got hosed and all this stuff. And it just <laughs> makes for a miserable time. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can, you can find a fight anywhere you go, Mm -hmm. anywhere you go. And it seems like we all know those guys that could walk into the church social and not get out of there without a fist fight because they bring it with them. And, um, 
I always, I always laugh and I, I can't mention any names, but I've, I've known guys like this, you know, that walk into a clubhouse and they'll be in there for five minutes and come back out and say, well, everybody in there is a dick. Yeah. And it's like, no, how can everybody? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's always, you know, it's always the same person. And it's like, they weren't very friendly in there. Well, it goes back to, if you want to be a friend, if you want to have friends and be a friend, yeah, go up, introduce yourself, sit yeah. down, you know, talk. We're all just hillbilly houndsmen. We're not going to roll a red carpet out for you most times, right? You know, but but we're most of the guys that are in these hunts are really good guys. You just get to know them. You know, I'll give you, really I'll give you guys. another perception I've made, and I know John Strickland was here a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, and John's one of those guys that that just he can talk to anybody. You know, oh, he yeah. just, he just personable and things like yeah. that. Jeff Rickliffs is the same way. Yeah. So for anybody that's going to a hunt, don't go with a chip on your shoulder. Don't be defensive. Disarm people with your friendliness yeah, because it's going to be a lot harder to screw you over yeah. if somebody likes you. But if you come yeah. in with a chip on your shoulder and you, and the, you leave that person thinking well, that guy's cocky. I'll, sh I'll teach him a lesson on this cast. Yeah. You're not going to get any breaks. No, I know. I don't know how many times and you've had these guys that are just a bear in a cast and it's, you know, been an hour into it and you're not having a good time and, and, and they want you to help shine their tree. And I'd like to say that I would help anybody find their coon, but there's cases where I won't. And there's cases <laughs> where a lot of people won't <laughs> because that guy is miserable to be around and he's already made me mad and I don't want him to win and I ain't going to help him find his coup. Yeah. So, I mean, you just, I, you, you get, you reap what you sow with that. And if you're personable and, and you are out to, to make friends and to have a good time, everybody's going to respond to that. And this will be the same way. This will be a good segue into your next point. So I was judging. Oh man. I don't know if it was a, classic hunt or autumn oaks it was one of the bigger events mm -hmm. and this guy showed up and he had a guy a, a spectator with him and uh, uh so we'd made a couple trees his dog hadn't treed yet and i looked over and these guys were just standing over there with their lights turned off while we're shining trees and one of the other handlers i, I think i said something to him i said guys you're going to help shine trees He's like nope we're not helping shine trees. Okay. Well, you're going to see coons. Yeah. We'll, we'll see a coon, but we're not, yeah. we're not going to shine tree. It's like, okay. So we get on into the cast and now this guy wants to shine it. You know, his dog's treed and, uh, he wants to have his buddy, his spectator helping shine the tree. And, uh, in the, by rule, then the majority of the cast has to agree to that. Yep. Guess what happened? They said well, no. Welcome to the show, Lone Ranger. Yeah. You can find your own coon. We are not shining yeah. your tree. And all that and, can be avoided if you just help the other handlers yeah. out and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I know why I found a coon for Al Nunneman one time. We was in the late round of the world hunt on Thursday night. And so this is our last chance to get in. And he was hunting nine and I was hunting con when he was a baby. And, uh, Al had got treed and I had treed con and there was only maybe seven or eight minutes left to go in this hunt. And so I, I blew the squalor and I found Al's coon, but even if he did have a coon, as long as I had a coon and nine didn't tree another one and just maybe the last two minutes, you know, I was going to win anyway. And I squalled this coon. I believe I squalled him out and we, the judge and had seen him before he jumped and we turned nine loose and he treed that coon again and uh beat me <laughs> <laughs> beat me with i think there's a minute left and nine trees this coon up a little bitty bush as we was on our way to con you know with just maybe <laughs> no time left on the clock so yeah i mean i i try to help i i will find al nunneman's coon anytime because i like al and i'd find any of them guys casting their coon because i like them no matter what the circumstances but if you treat people like a dog they're gonna they're gonna do it accordingly so you know just go in there with an open mind try to be friendly and <laughs> you, you'll be better off for it yeah even if it ends up beating you 
Even if it ends up beating me, Al got a <laughs> kick out of it. He did. He did say he got lucky in his final six interview when he, he got nine in the top six that year in the head to head round. So nine was a good coon dog. Al's a good guy. So I didn't mind it. It was a bad, bad deal, but you know, I had plenty of time to treat a coon in between there too. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the segue was, we talked about judging and then number seven says, uh, judge, you think it's easy? Give it a shot. Yep. Man, what is going on out there for that guy carrying the card? A lot. And I hate if I'm a not, if I'm a hunt, non-hunting judge, I don't mind it. I, I, I judge a lot of major events and a lot of high entry fee hunts. And I don't, it don't bother me if I'm a non-hunting judge. I hate being a hunting judge because you know, it's hard enough to focus on your dog. And you lose the step, you know, usually concentrating on everybody else's dogs too. But, uh, you know, you're, you're keeping times, you're writing scores. Uh, a lot of times everything's happening so fast, especially if you're a hunting judge, you don't have time to write those scores down. So you're keeping track of all that in your head until you get to maybe a tree that they're shining in the last couple of minutes and you can take a break and you can write that stuff down. And there's a lot going on. It's not, I'm not going to say it's a, crazy hard job but it's not as far as coon hunting goes it's about the hardest job out there and so you know these guys are the same way what they are with guides sometimes they're a little hard on judges and judges do make bad calls and some of them on purpose but not very often i mean it's pretty rare most of these judges are just out there trying to do a good job and also the best way to be a good handler is to judge you know you want to mm -hmm. know the rules you know you could you, you start keeping that scorecard and you start seeing what it's about and why these guys are making the decisions that they're making. And that will help you, you know, down the road as just a handler too. You know, I, I judged a lot of events before I really got on any kind of winning streak at all. You know, I mean, I, I was winning some casts here and there, you know, but until I started judging years ago, I didn't really, I wasn't grasping the whole picture. You know, mm -hmm. and when you, when you're packing that card and you're listening to everybody's dogs, you know, you really do get the whole picture. Yeah. Yeah. And, and judges are, um, there's a lot going on. You're getting, so as a judge, you've got to be there to judge dogs at every tree. Yep. Uh, you've got to be there. You've got to still be in a position where you can hear calls. So a lot of times what you'll get is if you're, if you're just a member of the cast, you can stand back away from that tree and still you be bet. able to call your dog off in yep. the distance yep you can walk um, 20 30 yards behind everybody yeah. you know you don't have yep. to be the first to a tree the non-hunting judge everybody thinks oh you know this guy's judging he's got an advantage but the hunting judge is at a big disadvantage in yes cast. i don't care yes. what anybody says there's too much to keep track of you're getting and, sucked in under yes. under trees with loud dogs you can't hear your dog you you know, you're trying to keep that all in perspective i'll tell you a really good experience i had and this this is about guys that are judging so i think we were hunting the uh pkc it was a super stakes fall and um uh, uh i was not judging and a guy another guy was carrying the card and he made a bad call and i just questioned him on it right then i was like that's not what the rules say and instead of getting defensive about it, he said, well, yep. what do, what's your interpretation of that rule? Yep. And I told him and the other cast members were like, yeah, that's right. And instead of bowing up and th saying, well, I'm the judge. And if you don't like yeah. it, you can question it. We'll take it back to, you know, whatever. We'll get a panel, blah, blah, blah. He's like, he was humble about it. Yep. And we just, he made the right call. And he said, I think you're right. And, and then there's been times and I've carried the card a bunch. And when you've got all that going on, I've made some of the dumbest, we all have dumbest all calls. Have. And so I always remember that when that guy was humble about it yeah. and you just step back, but there've been times when I didn't too. So I almost minus the coon uh, down in Texas at the Lone Star shootout, uh, Wyatt Monin was in that cast, uh, Mark Gilmore and one of the burdens and it was uh i was a non-hunting judge as a semifinal cast and you cast winners you know guaranteed to get about i think it was this was the semifinals i think it was going to the finals it was twenty thousand no it was a five thousand dollar check it's five thousand dollar cast and uh white's dog gets tree i go in there and i'm shining this tree and there ain't much there there's a small nest but it doesn't look like it could hold even a squirrel 
And yep. I'm thinking about Minus in this tree, and I'm telling Wyatt he's going to have to find me a place where this coon can hide. And Wyatt's a good kid. I like Wyatt. And he comes around the other side of that tree, and he says, here's the coon. And I look up there, and I can see what he's seeing. And I swear this is not a coon. I mean, if it is a coon, it's not near enough for me to plus it. And we squall, and we beat on this tree, and we're trying to make this thing move, and it's not moving an inch. And I end up circling the tree. Against my better judgment, I almost minus it. And we went 20 feet away to score Mark's dog on a tree. And as soon as we hit that squaller, that thing that Wyatt said was a coon poked its head up and looked at us. Mm. And I circled the coon right there. Wyatt, it did end up, I was thankful in the end that Wyatt did end up winning that cast, but I felt terrible. And Wyatt, yeah. to his credit, uh, you know, he kind of, he said, boy, that makes me sick. And that's pretty much all he said. You know, he was just his jovial, joking self right after that. And, yeah. you know, judges make bad calls. I made a bad one there. It happens. But you also have to realize that it's not as easy as, as it looks from the outside looking in. Yeah. I was I was hunting big country at the Labor Day Classic uh, 45 years ago or whatever. Yeah. And uh, Chris Saunders was judging. And, like yeah. And we're out on this cast. Country gets deep in trees. And I, if I, I knew I was going to win the cast, but I needed the points to get in the pay, you know, to get yeah. a paycheck that night. Yeah. So we walk in there underneath this tree and it was a three dog cast. The other guy was with us. Chris is carrying the card. We walk in there and we shine and we shine, we shine, we shine. And I look up and there was a coon laying on a limb right there. And I said, here he is. Come over there. The other guy looks up. The other cast member looks up. I said, you see him? He goes, yeah, that's Coon. And Chris looks up and he goes, I don't know that that, I don't think that's a Coon. Hmm. And, and I said, well, Chris is, that's a Coon lane right there. He goes, ah, I can't, I can't say that that's Coon. And I said, well, do you really need to? Two out of three of us say it's a Coon. He goes, nope, I guess I don't. He's yeah. just, he just <laughs> yeah. starts writing plus points on the card yeah. and boom, it, it was right at the end of the hunt. So, you know, I got what I needed and, yeah. and got no, in that Chris night. Chris is a good guy. I always that like was so funny. Chris. He's yeah. like, nope, I guess I don't. Yeah. No, Chris, is a, Chris is a good dude. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. What's number eight there, Josh? What's number eight on our list? Uh, it's a big one. Uh, take your minus. If you got it, come and take it. If you don't question it. There are rules in place to prevent bad calls and cheating. Use them. And here's the main part. Do it cordially. And we talk about problems in casts and stuff like that. And there are, there are some guys that just have a hard time taking their minus. You know, it's an obvious slick or their dog. A big one is the dog moving. Uh, you know, they don't want to take their minus. And those are the guys that we talked about earlier that are just miserable to having a cast. Mm-hmm. You know? You, there's there are plenty of ways to get by without throwing a fit in a cast. You know, I questioned a call just the other night, and and we were we it was fine. You know, I come off a tree, I questioned the call, we went back, we got a panel together, panel ruled. We were all friends afterwards. Everything worked out great. And so there's all kinds of ways to make sure that you don't get cheated. Uh, that goes back to the knowing the rules part. Uh, you can question the call. It goes to a vote. You can take it to a panel. If the panel still doesn't rule in your favor, you can appeal it and you can get another a panel together. So at that point, if you've lost your vote, if you've lost your first panel hearing and your second panel hearing, you're probably wrong. And so, you know, just, just take your minus, go on. Uh, it happens to everybody. Everybody's dog makes mistakes. Everybody's dog and handler are going to take some minus at some point in their career. Just take it and move on and go on to the next one. Yep. Yep. It's not always some big conspiracy. No, that, it's not. that, you know, to make sure and that you don't win that night. And it's not always the end of the cast either. I mean, I've, a lot of these guys that don't like to take their minus, it may be 25 points, you know, 20 minutes into the cast and they don't want to take it when they know they got it coming. And so, or you might put a question mark on the card at 20 minutes into the cast and go on to win it. Yeah. And you withdraw your question and it's a done yep. deal. You Doom. So, Over. Yeah. There's plenty of rules in place to keep people from getting cheated. Uh, they're very good rules in my opinion. And so just use them. You know, if you've got minus coming beyond that goes back to being honest with your dog. You know, if your dog treat a slick, don't be in denial. Just take your minus and go on. One of the rules on the back of that card 
is you you cannot interfere with other cast members or other dogs. Yep. And one of the things that I would always tell people when I was carrying the card, and they probably thought I was being a hard ass about it, but I got everybody together before and I told them there's a process and we're going to follow the process. Yep. So we're not going to stand out in the woods and argue and we're not going to throw fits. If, you know, if you, if you have a question, you ask me, if you decide to throw a fit, I'm going to ask you if you have a question, if you still want to throw a fit, you're going to the truck, you bet you're done. Yeah, so that's part of, that's part of judging those firm judges never have any trouble. Yeah. You know, they never do. Just get it just right up front. I mean, you just lay it out there and everybody normally respects that. And, and, but I've been on cast where, you know, guys disrupted a whole hunt by throwing this fit on a call that they guys, that's not the process. You know, yeah. nobody's perfect here. Not everybody's going to see the same things the same way every time. So if you get a minus, okay, now what do I need to do? You know, a boxer doesn't go in the ring and expect not to get punched exactly through the whole fight. You know, he's got to find ways to come out on top throughout the fight. And yeah. you're not going to, you're not going to have everything go your way in a baseball game or a football game. You just yeah. got to find you're ways get to win bad calls. And that's just yep. is what it is. Yep. Yep. Good, good advice on number eight for sure. Anything else on it? Uh, just uh, emphasis on the cordially. And if you'd have to, that's do hard to do. Call. Yeah, you have to do take a <laughs> take a, a panel back or go back to a panel. Uh, don't act fool with the panel either because we're all human beings. Even if a guy's right and he comes in here and acts like a jackass, I'm not going to want to lean toward his side. Now, I like to think that I would, you know, in all fairness and honesty. But but how you how you're perceived it goes a long ways with how people rule, you know, in your favor or against you, you know. So it, do it cordially, be a gentleman, and we're all supposed to be gentlemen out there anyway, and not just in coon hunting, but in life. So, you know, just be cordial. It'll get you a lot farther than you think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Number nine says there are rarely. I'm gonna have to argue with you about this one. <laughs> uh, there are rare, rarely bad breaks. Odds are your dog, your dog screwed up somewhere and it could have done something to prevent a bad break from cat costing it a win, mm -hmm. man. I have, there have been very few times, Josh, that I've showed up and got beat by a better coon dog. It's usually oh, bad yeah. luck and bad breaks and stuff like you that. About half the, half the other Facebook <laughs> handlers I see. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I'll tell you what. Um, uh, I drew a pup and Barry Edwards. I'll just give him credit right on this podcast. Barry Edwards Jr. had a yeah. pup out of Mr. Clean Jr. And we we're at the spring classic at uh, Hannah's Creek. And I was hunting country that night. And I'm telling you what, man, I left there with my hat in my hand. That yeah. dog put on a clinic that night. And yeah, Country did some dumb stuff that night that he shouldn't have done. But, but I'll tell you the thing that he didn't do that, that it could have won that cast is he didn't treat as many raccoons as that, exactly. as that clean pup did. Yep. I mean, that, that was the most flawless cast that I've ever seen uh, dog performance wise of any coon hound ever. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. I know that when we talk about bad breaks and yes, we've all caught bad breaks, but there's also a period somewhere in the cast. Usually sometimes it's a long period somewhere in the cast where your dog could have just not been doing what it was doing and treat one raccoon and none of that break would have mattered. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, Oh, I, you hear a lot of times everybody's griping about these babbling strike dogs and all the dog babbling. He beat me on strike. He beat me on strike. And I said, well, how many coons did you treat? He said, well, I treat two. I said, how many coons did the babbler treat? He said, well, he treat two. And I said, well, you should have treated three. You know, all you had to do was treat one more coon than that dog. And usually there's about a 20 minute section in there where his dog took some time off and, and, and it wasn't hustling around and wasn't looking to get a treat or it covered a tree or it done something. But these guys, this goes back to being honest with your dog is they, you know, they say, well, at the end, I just had this den and he had a coon and he beat me, but 
you know, that was the only tree that dog made. And there's only one coon treat all night. Yeah. So you just, Usually, and I hunt quarter strike dogs. I've hunted other than duds. Everything I've hunted has been a quarter strike dog. They don't say a lot on the ground. That's a last strike dog. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, we, we're, we're usually not picking, we're not picking up wins on strike points, but even the quietest dog, semi-silent, poor strike dog still can't be beat if it trees one more coon than the other dog. You know, odds are you tree, unless you're treeing an absolute coon zoo, Usually, if they tree two or three, you just got to tree three or four, and, and it doesn't matter how a dog strikes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's bad breaks, yes, and some some of them will cost you a win, but there's usually a point in that cast where your dog did something it shouldn't have, and that's what cost you more than the bad break did. I think probably babbling strike dogs, automatic strike dogs, are material for another podcast. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'll wait for you to do another I'll, hour and a half on that. Yeah, I'll wait for your next Facebook post before <laughs> yeah. we, we get back here and talk about that. But. Yeah, for a guy that hunts quarter strike dogs and hate a dog, I hate dogs that babble and bark. I really do. But I'm not as against them as people think. You know, if someone wants to hunt that, I'm all for it. But yeah, I'm they're, not. They're not my they're not my <laughs> cup of tea. <laughs> I'm not. All right. We're winding this thing down. Number 10. Go go ahead and this is big. Yeah, Go ahead and read that one, Josh. It's not about the best dog. Uh, this is a team sport. Good handlers make good dogs better and vice versa. And you'll see that a lot of these top handlers are always winning. And, you know, the Cables and the Wards and the and the Yants and the, and the guys, the Rickliffs, all these guys that are winning week in and week out, they're not doing it with the same dog all the time. You know, they're, they're doing it with a different dog. You know, some of them will go through one or two dogs a year. Some of them will go through four or five dogs a year, and they're still winning. Uh, you know, Weed went from down to Z to several others in between where he was still winning. You know, and it's it's a team sport. You, you have to make sure that you've got your ducks in a row just like your dog. And so everyone says, well, you know, it's we ought to just have these things to where the best dog wins, and, and the best dog – does win most of the time but it's also a team sport people don't, it ain't about the best coon dog it's the best handler coon dog combination that's who should win every cast yeah yeah and to put it in perspective you know i live right here across the river from kentucky you know right right across the ohio river is kentucky the thoroughbred yeah. cap capital of the world yeah and there's thousands of thoroughbreds and a very small percentage of those make it to yep. the track. But in order for them to make it there, they need a trainer and they need a jockey that can ride the horse. Yep. You could put That's me right. on, you could put me on man of war or secretariat, and I'm not going to win a derby That's or a, right. a triple crown. It's not yeah. happening. You know, there is something to, that handler and his involvement and and not only knowing his dog but but having the the courage to step up and and realize that this is my job right now is to yeah. do my part i've got to be the voice for this dog i've got to make the calls i've got to make sure that i put my keep my dog in a position where i can win yep and the, all those are part of the game and it doesn't mean you're getting cheated it just means that you're getting out handled exactly and there's so many small, minute details that good handlers do that, that common handlers don't. And, you know, I, I'm around a lot of good handlers. I don't consider myself a great handler. You know, I think I'm, I'm a terrible handler. I'll just say yeah, I think I'm a pretty decent judge of dog and I think I'm a pretty decent dog man, but whether I'm, uh, there, there's no way I'm a top handler, but these guys, they know, first of all, what kind of dog it takes to win for them. Uh, these guys are all winning with different style of dogs. You can probably take one of their dogs and give it to another top handler and they're going to struggle for a while. And so they know what kind of dog they need. Uh, they know how to find it. They know how to get it ready and they know how to do the little things in a cast, not just calling the dog, but how they get the dog off a tree, how they recut the dog, how they interact with the dog during the short periods that, you know, they have a dog on the leash or, you know, something like that. And there's, there's so many little things that make these guys just the top, you know, just a notch above everybody else and you got to learn those things i mean it like i said it's a team sport and a good handler will make a good dog great 
Yeah. Yeah. And the thing that I've noticed about top handlers, whether it's a, a coon hound, a bear dog, a lion dog, or a police canine. Yeah. That handler is consistent with that dog. Yep. You know, and we'll just talk about the part where the handler is interacting with the dog. You know, they're even keeled. They're consistent. Yeah. You know, they're not getting the dog out of the box and worried about, you know, the woman they saw at the gas station yeah. or, you know, getting distracted yeah. by that, the silliness, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's game time, it's business time. And again, just like your attitude transfers down the leash, that transfers down the leash. Dogs love rules. They love yep. consistency. They want to be handled the same way. And if you can get in that routine, whether it's pulling them off a tree or, or when you're walking them to, to the spot where you're going to cut them loose, yep. if you're, if you can learn to be consistent with that dog and even keel with that dog, you'll get better performance out of it. Some of these dogs pick up on just the slightest, uh, differences between certain situations and things like that you know you like i have a routine with every other every dog i take to uh you know when i let them out of the dog box to clean out and when i uh how often they're out of the dog rain i can buy yes. her out and just leave her there and she's going to relax on the end of a chain you know until cast time starts if i want uh, duds was never like that you let him out you let him clean out real quick you get him right in the dog box again you know they're all all these dogs react to different things differently how they're picked up off trees and how they're even hauled you know mm -hmm. just a strange dog box can mess up a dog sometimes if it's the right dog so just knowing those things and knowing that you got to do what it takes to to win just as much as your dog does is, is going to make you a lot more successful yep i've seen a lot of different stuff i used to have have i used to stop down the road before i got to the hunt and let the mm -hmm. dogs clean out and do that sort of stuff and then i might get them out and walk them around the truck and then boom it's right back in the dog box but when you go to a a you know, a, a five day hunt or whatever, yep. uh, that's hard to do breed days and different yep. things like that. Yep. You know, that, that, that really throws them for a loop, it but does. I've, I've seen guys do things like rodent dogs, you know, yep. before cast where they'll be on the back road of the fairgrounds or whatever, and they'll be roading the dog, but they do it every day. Yep. So it's consistent. It's not yep. something new to that dog. That's just a routine. Familiarity is very important to any dog. I don't care if it's a little Yorkie poo in, in somebody's lap or if it's a, a serious hardcore working dog to get the best out of that dog. The familiarity has always been important, I think. Yeah. Just like, just like we don't want a dog that's inconsistent. A dog doesn't want a handler that's, exactly. they don't, they don't know worth what they're getting no. every time yep. they get pulled out of the box. Yeah. So, but as far as the, uh, you know, the handler part of it, you know, it, it all, I think that's a great place to to sum up this comprehensive list here josh is because that that encompasses a lot of stuff in here about about knowing the rules and knowing your yeah. dog and you know what yeah. a great great way to and and how did how do you come up with this list it's just observation you know yeah but you told me where you wrote it where'd you write it well i was in the parking lot of the Mexican restaurant eating right after I got done eating lunch one day and I told everybody I just whipped it up but this stuff has been rolling around for for several years you know and so you had a moment of clarity I did I had a moment of clarity and when that happens you just got to reach out and grab it and make sure you write it down because especially as hectic as my work is it don't stay there very long <laughs> there's a lot of hours a lot of windshield time a lot of you know a lot of time when you're working or under a piece of equipment or something yep. and you're thinking about this but for somebody to to come up with this list you know co competition coon hunting not, occupies a big part of your brain buddy it does yeah. <laughs> it does i'm just guessing 40 50 percent of it and i tell people and there's it's not that i like being in a cast you know, nobody likes tromping through the woods at four in the morning when you're, you just got beat or something like that. But the preparation and, and training the dog and handling the dog, I can't get that from anywhere other than being in a competition coon hunt. You know, so I, I like that part of it. There's a lot of parts of it that I'm not as big a fan of as some other handlers, you know, that are there every week. But, uh, you know, even when I'm 
hunting a seven month old pup over here behind the house. That's always in the back of my mind and, and not even in the back of my mind. It's in the front of my mind. You know, every, everything we turn loose is, is with an eye to win, even if I'm not the one going to be winning with it, you know, yeah. so it's, it's how we base all our hounds. And that's why I like reading about lion dogs and beagles and, and I love English setters and I like working dogs of any kind because sometimes, you know, I'm so focused on this part of, of being a houndsman that I don't get to ever, you know, see the rest of it. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that uh, the list, the way you've got it laid out there, uh, it, it just speaks to hound houndsman in general. Yeah. Um, because if you get out ran on a bear race, it's not necessarily a bad break. What did your dogs do that, exactly. that they could have done better? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, several things here and we, we call those, those are known as transferable, transferable skills. And if you look at your list, you can find ways to apply a lot of that to any part of hound hunting, in my opinion. Yeah. I know we, yeah. we, we're basically, you know, focusing on, on the competition side, but, uh, competition yeah, hunting that, still holds a big part of, yeah. of, uh, you know, even if you're a, a houndsman from, from Idaho or, or even Australia and you're getting hounds from the United States, you know, you're going to look back in those pedigrees and you're going to see a dog that is that pedigree has been influenced by a dog that has probably been hunted in competition you at bet. some point. Exactly. And I will find that I did close on that and saying that you'll find out your dog isn't as good as you thought it was. And if, if you think it was better than you thought it was after your first cast or two, then you're not being honest with yourself because until you get them in top tier competition and see what it's like lining up to some of these, these bigger dogs and these dogs that have been winning all over the country, there's just no comparison, you know? And yes, these dogs are just dogs. You know, you said big country got thumped a few times. Big country is one of my favorite dogs I've ever judged. Uh, I've been beat with some really good dogs. I've seen dogs that have won, you know, 150. I've seen dogs, I've seen Ruby look bad. Ruby's the winningest coon hound of all time. And I've seen her make mistakes too. So they're all dogs and they all make mistakes. But when you don't put your dog under any kind of pressure, uh, they're going to look a lot better than when you, you line them up next to three strangers and three strange dogs and things like that too. So, yep. I couldn't agree more. And it's, uh, goes back to that saying that somebody came up with you know a lot of the things that affect affect us and affect our hounds and affect the competition hunt is our ego you know yep. we feel like we don't want to go back being the loser yep. we don't want to go back saying that we got beat we don't want to make that long drive home thinking about that mistake we made or or this place where the dog could have done better so you know, an ego is a heavy burden for your oh, dog to carry. You bet. Yep. Yep. Well, Josh, man, it's getting dark here and I'm, I'm going to go try to tree a raccoon, believe it or not. I believe, I think I'm going to do the same thing. Jed come over and picked up rain a little bit ago. So I'm going to go turn con loose a couple of times, I think. So yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to turn loose some trashy plots. Yeah. bear dog plop bear dogs and let them get stretch their legs and maybe tree a raccoon that'd be good for them yeah <laughs> yep yep i think we got i think our connection just went upside down on us there it is you're back yeah. you're back <laughs> yeah i was i was making fun of your plots did you miss all that you were doing what i was making fun of your plots did i did you miss all that <laughs> i think i did oh <laughs> I'm not it, even gonna. Re I'm not even gonna repeat it. Then it conveniently <laughs> shut down. Yeah, See? It conveniently paused about the time I started making. Fun that was dogs. something from a higher power. <laughs> yes. That was not. That was not yeah. edited post production here. That was from a higher power. Don't be knocking on the plots. <laughs> Josh, buddy, yeah. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the podcast again. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, and we're gonna. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all you guys do for Hound Honey. We really appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate that, Josh. But, buddy, until next time you follow your hounds and I'll follow mine. <laughs>